Okay, book of Colossians, Colossians for Beginners. This is lesson number four in this uh, series. And today we're going to cover uh, chapter one, verses 13 to uh, verses 18. Let's uh, begin with a bit of a review as we do uh, each time. Uh, we said that Paul the Apostle was in a Roman prison somewhere uh, between 61 and 63 AD when he wrote several epistles. One of these epistles was an epistle or a letter, if you wish, to the brethren at the church in Colossae. Now this particular church was located about a hundred miles west of uh, the church in Ephesus. And I said that it was originally established by uh, Epaphroditus and Timothy, two workers, uh, two preachers that uh, worked with Paul the Apostle. Uh, this particular congregation was being disturbed by teachers who were proposing what they insisted was a more enlightened form of Christianity and their teachings were creating disturbances uh, uh, in the church at that time. Uh, this new teaching, if you wish, this enlightened form of gospel uh, in reality was simply a mixture of Greek philosophy uh, and Jewish uh, legalism, Jewish traditions, which uh, threatened to rob the Colossians of their freedom and their salvation in Jesus Christ. And so this letter, this is the response to this problem in this church. In response to the teachers, Paul reiterates the all sufficiency of Jesus Christ in every area of life, whether it be personal relationships, doctrine, or ethical conduct. So in our last lesson, we studied the first 12 verses of uh, chapter one. And in the first 12 verses, uh, Paul you know, kind of accomplished a certain number of tasks, if you wish, did a, a several things in those verses. He uh, first of all established his authority as a teacher, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and also the position of Jesus as the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then he offered a prayer in which he reviews their history as a church, the Colossians, reviewing their history uh, as a church. And he says about them that uh, they've been a, a faithful group, uh, they've been a loving church. Uh, he encourages them to remain this way and to look to the future uh, with hope. Uh, and in the passage, he also reminds them of the hope or the reward that awaits them if they remain faithful. And then he finishes his prayer with an appeal to God to give these people a knowledge of His will, uh, to give them the ability to please Him, to increase uh, their power so that they can attain the virtues of patience and steadfastness. And also he prays that they have the ability to remain joyful through the entire uh, process. All right, so today we're going to go, uh, we're going to pick up the last uh, piece in verse 12 where Paul is uh, building a bridge to his next, to his next thought. So now we move to the first big section, Christ preeminent in personal relationships, chapter one, verse three to chapter two, uh, verse seven. That's the entire you know, section. We won't cover all of that today, but um, that's what the entire section uh, entails. So after finishing his prayer, Paul is going to move into his first main thought about Jesus Christ. And that is that Jesus is preeminent in personal relationships. What he means by that is that um, only Jesus has a relationship with God. See what I'm saying? That's what, you know, that's what Paul is trying to get at, that Jesus has the foremost, the preeminent relationships. Why? because only He has a relationship with God. Only through Him can we have a relationship with God. And only through Him can we be united in a meaningful and spiritual and eternal way with God. So that's what he means about you know, His relationship uh, is the foremost preeminent relationship. Now to get to this thought from his prayer, Paul finishes the prayer by giving thanks to God the Father for giving the Colossians the opportunity to go to heaven. And this blessing, this you know, going to heaven and experiencing eternal life and so on and so forth, this particular blessing he calls an inheritance of the saints of light. So 
uh, from this idea and this key word light, he's going to build a bridge to the idea that Jesus is the king of the kingdom of light. As opposed to the kingdom of darkness, which infers a condition of lostness and ignorance and uh, suffering and so on and so forth. And so we read in verse 13 and uh, uh, 14, he says, for he, meaning Jesus, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. I take that back, I mean the father, for he the father rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So let's stop there. Several important concepts included in these verses. First of which is rescue or deliverance. This word implies that they were helpless to save themselves. Um, he, talks, uh, he uses the word domain, the domain of darkness. Uh, another word for power or authority. And the idea is that these people were, ke were kept uh, in the domain of darkness purposefully by a power that was greater than themselves. They were slaves to sin, slaves to Satan. Uh, he used the word transfer. And he says that God himself does the work of saving us and uniting us to his son. He chooses the Son and only the Son to do this work. All right. And then he uses the word kingdom. This word denotes a royal power or sovereignty, the apex, if you wish, of power and rule. So in essence, God, by His own will and choice, transferred us from one who was stronger than we were to one who was stronger than the one who kept us prisoner. To clarify our position and as a reminder to the Colossians, Paul also mentions the original gift that began the life that he prayed about you know, at the beginning of the letter. So he says they were forgiven. They received redemption. That's the gift. All right? The others, rescue, domain, transfer, kingdom, refers to the thing taking place, you know, transferred from one place to another. But what does all that entail? What, what does that result in? What is the gift at the end of all of this activity? Well, he says forgiveness, redemption. They're forgiven by virtue of the fact that Jesus died to redeem their sins. In other words, to, he paid the moral debt, made restitution. There's so many ways that you can kind of explain what it is that he did, but they all come back to the same, the same idea. And I like to use the term, Jesus paid the moral debt for our sins with his death on the cross. So this is the power that kept them in uh, the dark. Uh, the fact that they were sinners and they were helpless to stop sinning and they were unable to atone for the sins that they did commit. That, that's what kept them prisoner to the strong one, the, the, the devil, Satan. You know, even though they knew that sin would be punished by death, that sin was wrong, even if they wanted not to sin, they were helpless. They were helpless to stop sinning and they could not pay the moral debt for the sins that they did commit. That's what he's talking about. That's what kept them bound. So they were subject to Satan's temptations and then they were cursed by the law to be punished and condemned because they failed. So what happens at this point? Well, this is the gospel message. Jesus comes, the Son of God, he lives a perfect life according to the law, resists every attack by Satan, and then offers his perfect sinless life on the cross to satisfy the demands for restitution made by law. So now people you know, trapped in sin and condemned because of it and helpless to change, now we have a way to deal with sin. Not just you know, the old way is that you know, we just keep piling on sin after sin after sin, even if we know that this is going to end up condemning us. Now there's a, there's a way to deal with this. You know, Satan is defeated because now the law is satisfied and sinners are released into the custody of Christ. And this custody, this group, Paul refers to as the kingdom, the church. 
So Satan is defeated because Jesus takes away his power. What was his power? His power was to tempt us to sin and then the law would condemn us because we sin. Well, you know, Jesus takes away his power. How does he do that? Well, by making restitution for our sins, our sins no longer condemn us because he's paid the price for those sins. And because we receive the Holy Spirit and we have the knowledge of the truth, we now have tools, we now have an agency, we now have the power to deal with our sins, to overcome our sins. That's how he destroys the power of, of Satan. Of course, the emphasis here is that Jesus is the one who sacrificed to make this happen. And so he is central to our salvation to begin with. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this letter is written to counter the false teachers among the Colossians. They taught that things other than Christ's sacrifice were needed to achieve or to maintain salvation. That's, that's, very, that's an important idea because it informs you know, what Paul is talking about here. Why is Paul talking about all this? The transfer from the kingdom of darkness to light and that Jesus is the one. And why is he going all, all over this? Well, Paul is responding to these, these false teachers by putting Christ and His sacrifice as the only thing that produces salvation. Redemption equals forgiveness. Nothing more, nothing less. So in verses 15 to 17, Paul will address another of their teachings that concerned the worship of angels, for example. And he responds to this idea by describing Christ's true position in the scheme of creation and the Godhead. So he responds to their idea, the false teacher's idea, that there was something else you needed to do. You needed to become a Jew. You needed to be circumcised. You needed to do something else in order to be saved, you know, in order to be transferred into the kingdom of, of light. And Paul responds, no. The sacrifice that Jesus made, this is, this is the complete thing. Nothing else is needed to effectively transfer lost sinners from Satan's binding into the kingdom of light. All right. Next, as I said, he's going to describe Jesus' true position in the scheme of creation to answer another of the false teacher's claims that uh, in some way angels were part of the equation, that they needed to worship angels or recognize them or use them as intermediaries between themselves uh, and God. And so in answer to this false notion, Paul is going to uh, put forth Jesus' true position in regards to the Godhead and man. So with that in mind, let's read verse 15. He says, He, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And so in verse 15, he uh, makes two uh, statements. First, talking about Jesus, he says he's the image of the invisible God, meaning Jesus is not a reflection of God, but of the same divine essence. And God is not seen by human eyes, but Jesus is seen, and He is the visible image of the invisible God. Right? Didn't Jesus say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Right? So uh, it, it, it's not just uh, the body of Jesus, not like God has two arms and you know, two legs. When we see Jesus, we see the word of God, the life of God, the spirit of God, the intention of God, the holiness of God, the love of God. We see all of that in human, in human form. And then he says he's the firstborn of all creation. Doesn't mean that he was the first thing created or somehow emerged at the beginning of creation, as some religions teach. Firstborn refers to his rank and his position in comparison to all of creation, including mankind. Mankind was created, right? Mankind wasn't born, man wasn't born, he was created. The universe was created, not born. Well, Paul is saying here that Jesus is first in rank and position 
in both of His natures. He is divine, the very image and essence of God, and He is human, the very essence and perfection without sin or blemish, born of a virgin. I neglected to mention that angels were created also. But Jesus is not created, He's, he's first, He has rank. Then he says the power of creation in chapter 1 verse 16. He says, for by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. So now what is he saying? Well Paul goes on to explain that in addition to his divine essence and rank, Jesus is the power behind creation itself. This includes the visible universe, and it also includes the world of spirits which we do not see but exists nevertheless. And this certainly includes angels who are being promoted as objects of worship by these false teachers. So the inference that Paul is making here is that we don't need to worship angels, Christ is over them as well. So we worship Christ and we do so um, uh, correctly, because He's over angels and over the universe and over mankind. He has first rank. Then he talks about the purpose of creation, verse 16b. It says, all things have been created through Him and for Him. So Paul adds the point that not only were all things created through the power of Christ, they were also created for His purpose. In Ephesians chapter one, Paul explains in that particular epistle that from the very beginning of time, God's purpose was to bless the people in Christ, another way of saying the church, the kingdom. So from the beginning of time, God's purpose was to bless those in Christ with all the blessings of heaven. Forgiveness, resurrection, glorification, exaltation to the right hand of God. So this is what he refers to here in Colossians when he says, for him. Everything in creation, everything in history, in one way or another, works in Christ's ultimate plan to bless the church with these spiritual gifts. You know when we say, what's the end game? What's the point? What's God trying to get to with all of this? Well, what, trying to, what God is attempting to get to in all of this is that He has blessings that He wants to give those who believe in Christ. And everything, He works everything in human history, everything towards this end. So at the end, those who believe in Christ, those who are in Christ, the church, the kingdom of light, all the different ways that are used in the Bible to describe these people, the chosen ones, the pillar of truth, you know, all the various ways to describe the people of God. God has these spiritual blessings that He wants to give to those people. And His plan has been worked in such a way so that at the end of time He will be able to do that. Then He talks about a time before creation. In verse 17 He says, He, always talking about Jesus now, He is before all things. So, Paul expands Christ's role by declaring that Christ is before all things, denoting His divinity. Why? Because only God is before all things. I mean, who is before time? Who is before creation? Well, only God. And so when he says that Jesus is before all things, before time, well, he's referring to Jesus as God. In 17b he says, and in Him all things hold together. So he also says that in Jesus all things hold together. In other words, he not only is the agent through whom all things were created, but it is also because of him that all things continue to exist. He creates all things and in the end, when he returns, all things will cease to exist again by his power. And all things are sustained, why? Well, all things are sustained by His power because of God's ultimate plan, which is what? 
which is to de deliver the spiritual blessings of heaven to those who are in Christ. That's why all things are being held together. That's why everything continues, morning and day, day and night, you know, planting and harvest and seasons, and it just keeps going. Are there changes in the world? Is there like such a thing as climate change? You know, I always say, well, yeah, yeah, sure, climate change. You know, it started at the flood. The climate started to change at the flood. And people change and societies and there are wars and there are earthquakes and all kinds of things that are happening. But the earth continues and will continue until Jesus returns. Why? Because He is the power that sustains it. Then he goes on in verse 18, he says, He is also head of the body, the church. So in this passage, Paul gives not only the last link in Christ's chain of sovereignty, but he introduces a new idea to bridge to the next section about the church, especially the church at Colossae. Remember, previously the idea was the kingdom of light, and he used that as a bridge you know, to talk about the chain of authority or you know, Christ's position. In the next section he's going to talk about the church. So he finishes this section with a reference to the church. He gives the church another name here using the term body so as to fit the imagery of Christ as the head, the head of the church, right? Metonymy, same, remember we talked about that last time. So Paul is going to go on to explain why Christ is the head of the church and the significance of this for every member of the church. And we are going to continue, of course, in this line of teaching and pick this up uh, next time. Um, in the end, the basic argument or false idea being put forth with the Colossians was that in some way Jesus Christ was not enough to secure and maintain one's salvation with God. That was, the, that was the, the thrust of the false teaching. There needed to be perhaps ceremony. There needed to be a secret worship of angels. There needed to be some form of law keeping of some kind. There needed to be uh, new teachers because the old teachers, the apostles, Paul, you know, uh, they, they had not given them all of the information. And so Paul's response is to show that Christ's chain of authority went from start to finish, from, from, from heaven, right, the image of the invisible God, all the way down to the earth as the head of the church. From God to the creation to the church to the end of time and the end of God's purpose. Christ, you know, he's, every, he's every link in the chain of authority. The only thing that mattered was Christ Himself because He was divine in nature. He was first in rank. He was before all things. He created all things. <clears throat> Excuse me. He sustained all things. He uses all things for His purpose. And He is head of the body, the church. Now in the next section, Paul will show how the church plays a central part in Christ's purpose and what that ultimate purpose is. For now, let's, let's see if we can draw some lessons. You know, even though Paul was indirectly responding to false teachers of the first century, there are a lot of lessons that we can draw from this passage for our lives as Christians today. One of the lessons is this. We must have a relationship with Christ. You know, I said that this section, you know, verses three all the way to chapter two, verse seven, was about the preeminence of Christ in relationships. When we see that everything is plugged into Christ in one way or another, we realize that if we don't have a relationship with Him, we don't have a relationship with God either because He's the Son of God. That's how we plug into God. We're plugged into Him. Um, if we don't have a relationship with Him, we're ignoring the person who is first in rank in everything. If we don't have a relationship with Him, we're ignorant and neglectful of praising the right person for everything in creation. It is correct that, that various peoples and religions in the world praise and give thanks for the creation and what they have. 
It is, however, futile for them to do so to anyone other than Christ. Because he's the one that's plugged into God, not other prophets or other you know, religious leaders. And of course, without a relationship with Christ, we're not part of his body and his ultimate plan for mankind, which is to bless the body with all the spiritual gifts of heaven. So to reject Christ is to fail in all of these other areas as well. So lesson number one, we need to have a relationship with Christ. Lesson number two, when we have Christ, we have everything. Paul does us a great favor here by exposing the vastness of Christ's authority and His power. You know, Christianity is not a Western religion. People say, well, Western religion like Christianity. It's not a modern religion. It's not one of the great religions of history. Christianity is the heart and soul of God's plan for every soul ever born, regardless of place and time and position. There is no other plan. There is no other Savior. There is no other Lord than Jesus Christ, who is over time, He's over creation, He's over heaven and life and sin and death and the church and eternity. Let's face it, there's nothing left to be Lord over once you've finished attributing to Christ all the elements that He's Lord over. There's nothing left to be the Lord of once you count all the things that Jesus is Lord of. See what I'm saying? This is why the confession, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, this is why this confession is the greatest, deepest, most insightful, life-changing declaration that anyone could ever make. And then of course, lesson three, when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. Now when Jesus told His disciples to ask or pray in His name, that's in John 14, 14, uh, He didn't do this just to give us a habit so that every single prayer that we pray ends in the words, in Jesus' name. So that if you don't say, in Jesus' name, then the prayer is no good. He wasn't giving us a formula here. He gave this to remind us that everything we prayed about was His concern because it was all within His authority. Remember I said He's, he's, he's you know, the divine image you know, from the top, in heaven all the way to the head of the church on earth and everything in between. So everything we pray about can be about earthly things or spiritual things or heavenly things. He's the Lord over all those things. So life and death and food and weather and power and spiritual strength, whatever. He's the sovereign over everything in existence and He uses everything in existence for His purpose. Therefore our prayers in His name go to the only being who really understands and who really can answer them. And when we say in Jesus' name, we're merely you know, remarking, we're merely underlining, confirming that we understand and we believe that He is over all these things and our prayers are being offered to the right person. So this should not only encourage us to direct our prayers towards Him, but also give us confidence that our prayers are never in vain when they are in His name and should keep us uh, and help us rather understand why we use this term in our prayers. OK, well that's uh, the lesson for uh, this particular section, chapter 113 to 18a. We're going to pick it up next time and move on as we study the book of Colossians. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.